Paul Gauguin. Why should we care? Short answer, we shouldn't. But uh, I'm assuming you might want the long answer to explain things. So, okay, here we go. All right, so let's get into it. Eugene Henry Paul Gauguin, a.k.a. Paul Gauguin, a.k.a. Gogi, a nickname I'm going to be referring to him as throughout the rest of this video, so just deal with it. He was born in 1848 in France. Um, he would grow up, get married, have a couple... Well, he, he would have like a five kids, uh, so that's not actually a couple, but he would have some kids and eventually would become a very successful businessman at like the age of 23 so that's honestly kind of cool and crazy to think about but hey you know that's that's what that's what he did so neat eventually he picked up painting as a hobby but he didn't really you know didn't really go anywhere with it oftentimes uh criticism from critics would be you know you know just okay or you know not met with a lot of fanfare and some very dismissive reviews. But, um, you know, later on, after he's a businessman, uh, the stock market crashes in Paris, so he's out of a job. And so then what does he do in this time of desperation? He puts all of his chips on becoming an artist, and that's it. He becomes a full-time painter. And that doesn't really work too well with his household. And eventually, that coupled with a lot of um, probably personal issues and just con conflicting ideology leads his wife to leave him with the children. So, yeah, now he's wifeless and doesn't really have the children around, so he can fully become a painter now. Yay, he gets what he wants, right? Well, around this time, still, not much is going on for his painting career, but he's getting to kick it with the likes of Pizarro and Cezanne, two very highly respectable names in the art history world, two impressionistic godfathers, essentially. I assume he gets to hang out with them in a sort of proto paint and sip kind of way, where they all just paint beautiful masterpieces out in the middle of nowhere and drink a lot of wine and get drunk. So, you know, we're missing out on some good good biopics if that's a if that's a thing that happened so eventually Gauguin's painting style evolved from somewhat pseudo impressionistic because he he was trying to be impressionistic but then it, it evolved into something called clone colonialism clone and cloesonism cloesonism and cloesonism was a style that was you pretty much the use of big shapes of color mixed with, um, uh, you know, outlines on figures and such. And around this time that he delved into this new style of painting, you start to see some maybe familiar works of his pop up around this time. Some that you're like, oh yeah, that's that's a classic Gauguin. That might be something more I'm familiar with. Um, so that's pretty pretty cool. And probably around this era is my favorite paintings of his come out honestly but more on that later because right now i think what's that oh yeah uh the van goghs are arriving so now the story takes a interesting turn as the brothers van gogh essentially uh teddy and vincent show up in gogan's life teddy uh, not teddy what the fuck Why are so around this time gogi would be introduced to theo and vincent van gogh and the three would become friends, essentially. Um, and some interesting stuff would come out of this three-way relationship. Theo, for instance, actually got Gauguin a permanent installation in a couple of different studios, so that's pretty cool on his part. And that probably also was a nice way of saying, hey, uh, why don't you go hang out with my brother Vincent in his house? And so, Gogi then packed up his stuff, because I, I, don't, I don't, you know, he's living cheap, so... Sure, why not go live with another artist? And he moves into Vincent's house in Arles. And this might be where some go, wow, really? Gauguin and Vincent van Gogh under one roof? Holy crap, this is like an amazing 
meeting of the minds. Like, what, what, what could go wrong? Well, there must be so many good things that come out of this relationship and this meeting. Well, uh, buckle up because it's going to get really weird really fast. Honestly, I'm pretty shocked that both of them stayed and as long as they did because the two immediately found out that they weren't really, you know, made for each other in a sense. Um, the two would often bicker and get into fights as well as just the weirdest stuff. And the accounts of who did what actually are kind of gray in areas because if you read a book about Gogon, for instance, they'll say, oh, Vincent's just a loon who had emotional issues and couldn't, you know, hang out with him. But if you read a Vincent Van Gogh book, they'll tell you that Gogon's a fucking asshole. We don't know really you know, who said what, who did what, but essentially the stories will go like this. The two would wanted, in fact, to make like an art colony together um, where they could invite other artists and perform art together, I guess, you know, just help growing as a whole. And so Van Gogh was super down for this and so was Gauguin, but Gauguin's a little bit of an arrogant person, so he would oftentimes criticize Van Gogh to the point of making Vincent really emotionally disturbed at, at parts, I would say. He pretty much tormented the guy. In fact, Gauguin famously painted a photo picture, essentially an old-fashioned Photoshop job of two of Vincent's works together, just combine the two and saying, hey, uh, this would have been a much better painting and you didn't do it and you, you, know, you wasted time on it, essentially. So I'm sure that really made Vincent feel good. Some big aspects of why the two didn't get along would be that Gauguin really emphasized an approach to the art which was art should be made from the memory, you know, just, whoa, I remember what a tree looks like. I'm going to paint a tree. And that's art, right? Well, Van Gogh necessarily didn't say that he was wrong, but he certainly said that, no, I, uh, one could paint from life and that would also be just as much art as whatever the hell you're pushing, Gauguin. So that was another big rift between the two. And it would all come to a head after two months of living together, probably disagreeing, paint. By the way, they, they both of them painted a large amount of paintings around this time and some of their best, um, respectively. Although, you know, Vincent would get better after this time period and Gauguin would not. So around after two months, Gauguin and Vincent have a confrontation, a big blow up, if you will. Uh, in which Vincent even brings a straight edge razor, you know, to him. And I don't know if he threatens him or who knows, really. I mean, someone probably does, but I didn't really research that part. So let's just move past that aspect. After this confrontation, Vincent is so, you know, just emotionally distraught over the things. He then goes to a brothel that the both frequented, both guys frequented in this brothel. And he then went to a, you know, brothel worker you know, and essentially cut off his ear and gave it to her. It was a, it's a weird move, but um, it happened, I guess. So after help putting Vincent into a state that needed to be put into a nut house, essentially into a mental asylum, Gauguin left Arles after, you know, ruining Vincent's uh, just life, maybe. Um, and where does Gauguin then go? Tahiti. But before we get into that quagmire, we should probably talk about cynicism. And cynicism was like cloesonism, in a sense, except you then add some more aspects to it. So you have the aspects of shapes of color and outlines, but then we'll throw in an emphasis on like subject matter and also the artist's relationship and feelings about said subject matter. Oh, okay. So on to Tahiti. Gogi then, you know, after the whole Arles debacle goes to Tahiti and, you know, he just falls in love with the people and the overall culture of the Polynesian Isles and 
Uh oh, drama alert. Looks like Ogan has married a 14 year old native girl on the island. Yikes. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh man, what's that? He also had two other mistresses that were underage too. I don't get it. What is his point? What, why? Why? I, is it a custom? It might have been a custom. Why did he accept the custom? What a creep. Huh. What a creep. And I'm sure this won't affect how people might view his legacy. I mean, I, <laughs> it won't affect how I view his legacy, will it? Nope, not at all. No, but seriously, he, he dives into this, this art movement known as primitivism, which, which is essentially the 1800 equivalent of culture appropriation. And that's, that's, that means it's okay, but it's not. He's, he's just a culture vulture, and he's just painting what he thinks the Tahitian uh, uh, natives, I mean, how they would paint. And that's, that's not right. That's pretty fucked up, if I, if I do say so myself. And guess what? It, it doesn't even look good. It looks like shit. It looks like a, like a, it does, it's just rude. It's offensive and rude and it's racist and, and it's bullshit. But I guess, I guess because he's like a really good art person, a really good painter, that we, we, we look over the fact that this is like just the, the grossest, grotesque, uh, is, look, could it be worse? Yeah, it could be worse. But, um, I don't, this is worse and it's in museums. Why? I don't get it. I mean, there's, this is offensive and rude. And I'm not just talking about the subject matter. It's visually offensive to me. It looks like garbage. And then sometime in 1903, he dies from a combo of syphilis and drug overdose. Now time for some art. So the first piece we're going to talk about is the market gardens of Vergara, jeez. Ah, so, hey, I don't know French, so these names will get butchered, and I apologize for that. And not in my attention to be rude at all. I just, I can barely speak English. So, the first painting we're going to be talking about is the Market Gardens of Vigard. 1879 was when this painting was made, and as you can see, it's pretty reminiscent of that impressionistic style, that movement at the time that was super duper big. And overall, it's it's not bad. It's it's a painting, I guess, you know. It's pretty run-of-the-mill, I would say. It's very early on in his career, so yeah. Ah, this one is a personal favorite of mine. It is called Vision After the Sermon, and it's about a bunch of nuns watching an angel beat the absolute shit out of a man. Honestly, it's a, it's a very wild painting, I would say. Just the the harsh red orange of like the the ground is so wild to me but it really makes the piece work in a super weird way the greens help pop against that reddish orange background and it, it you know but it also it's subtle enough because it's a soft green that it's not wholly distracting and it, it almost in a sense you your eyes get drawn to the white of the nuns and then go up using the tree down into the angel giving the ass kicking and that's that's pretty nice man he's just he's really getting them he's really beating them up on that one just woof okay so this one is that photoshop job i was telling you about that he did on some van gogh pieces and it's called night cafe arles 1888 was when it was you know conceived i guess and it's a combo of that famous you know night cafe painting of van gogh as well as a as a, of a painting that looks it's just the same painting to be fair it's an interesting painting but i you know i don't know if the the ends justify the means of doing it speaking of vincent here is one of him and it's called the painter of sunflowers 1888 was when it was made this one might be one of my favorite gauguin pieces not because it has Vincent Van Gogh in it because I, that doesn't mean shit to me, but because it's just overall very pleasing to look at. You know, the, the colors all around just meld together and you really get this nice somber feel from it, which is almost poetic in a sense, but also super funny because I do, I don't want, there's probably some fighting going on behind scenes of this one. Let me tell you something. I really do enjoy Gauguin's depiction of like noses. Yeah, that might be weird. Is that weird? I like his noses. Gogi does some good noses and he, here's one too, you know, nice. 
Moving on, here's the Green Christ, 1889. And this one is this one is also one of my favorites, honestly. The beach cliff landscape coupled with the ocean and the sky are really nice. And then you get this very, very weird, like just it, green statue, religious statues, and it's super odd. And then you see there's like this this woman and her face is green too and she's like almost like a goblin lady and it's she's just crouching behind these religious statues and it's just a very odd thing but if you just block that out you see this very nice beach landscape and then you get introduced to just madness essentially and i know i know it's supposed to be like you know a nun in religious statues but it just looks it just looks bizarre, honestly. But that's what's so fun about it. Also, notice how her face, skin tone wise, doesn't match her hands at all. I don't know what, what's up with that. I mean, I don't know. She just looks sick. Sick? She's a sick goblin lady. What can I say? All right, and a classic. We have to throw in a self-portrait. So here is self-portrait with Halo and a snake. And let me tell you something. That snake is awesome. It's just the funniest looking snake, and it makes the painting Literally, if you were to take his his weird looking face out of this painting, it would be awesome. Again, nose is good. That's a good nose, Gogi. You got a good nose, bro. Like, nice. And then he puts a halo on him, and that doesn't sit well. That doesn't sit well. Why, who puts a halo on themselves? You're just an arrogant person, Gogi. Listen, if we ever meet face to face, I'm going to first tell you you got a good nose and you do good noses. And then two, I'm going to say, what kind of douche puts a halo on himself? Uh-oh, here comes the yellow Christ. So I've been talking about skin tone a lot. And the reason I am is because I think a lot of his figures, they just have this yellow skin. It's like they all have jaundice or something, which I don't know. Maybe they did back then. I don't think they did, but Gogan certainly depicts them as almost having um, this. So, yeah, they might all have jaundice. Okay. So we're going to talk about Tahitian women on the beach. Okay. I'm fine with that. Made in 1891, probably on his first trip to Tahiti. This one, I'll say it. I don't think it's that bad. I think it's, you know, pretty good. This is probably what most of his paintings around this time should look like. It's still his same cynicism style, right? But it's depicting what he's seeing. And there's a, there's a level of care in it, and it's great. The red in the dress is great. The, the figures themselves are great. There's some emotion in the eyes, and that's, that's, that's nice. I, I do enjoy that. Okay. 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 Yeah. So this is, a, I guess, called Tahitian landscape. Now we're starting to get into why I think it visually sucks. I, yeah. I guess this is what he thinks they would paint like, I guess. It's like he forgot how to use his colors right, but he still wants to use his colors, and so it doesn't really mix as well. And it's feeling like it's an underdone painting, you know? Like, it's not quite done, but it's probably done. And maybe it was not finished, but we don't know that. So this is... I think this is a weak landscape. I think he, I think he, you know, was... I think he's pretty good at landscapes, honestly. Especially back in, when he was in Europe. I think those are some good landscapes that use color really well. But this is just bizarre. Um, which, hey, I'm talking about it now. So joke's on me. So to wrap it up, here is one of his most famous paintings. Um, I'm gonna just call it day of the god because i believe that's the english translation but the title could be on the screen there it is it's made in 1894 this is probably when he went back to tahiti and was starting to really soak up the culture um look right if i were to crop in on that like upper right corner it's a good painting right that's a good landscape the figures. I like it. I can't really see them. I can't really see them. So they're not too offensive to me. So it's good to me, right? I like that corner. 
But unfortunately, there's more than just the corner. I don't know what the hell is going on. Uh, first of all, I have to blur some of this because there's just nudity, which, hey, you know what? Fine. Nude and art, nudity and art. Yeah. Goes hand in hand. So they think so. Whatever. I don't have a problem with that. Problem maybe is that these women are probably, I'm going to say maybe 14 to 18. I, they could be older, but he has a type apparently in his children. So, you know. I'm just going to guess they're 14 to 18 years old, so that doesn't feel good at all. And then, I don't know what the fuck kind of acid trip is going on in the foreground, but it's going on all right. And honestly, if you like, just look at it, it's pretty. It's cool. The colors are nice in it, but I don't know what's happening. Shame on me. I don't know what's happening in this painting. For all I know, it's a. It's, maybe this is a real thing, but I think that some people have gone on record that like he's forced this this like look of primitivism onto these people like maybe they were actually more um not as primitive as he thought and so he was like no that's not tahiti this is tahiti and then he paints this like i've heard that version of gugan so i wouldn't be i wouldn't be surprised if this was all just bullshit that he just was like no i'm gonna i'm gonna paint this well clearly i'm conflicted on gogi and on the legacy he left behind. On one hand, dude's a pretty solid painter, I would say. And he has earned a spot in art history for sure. He did some very experimental stuff back then. And I think it paid off. But on the other hand, the dude seems like a real asshole. And that whole primitism shit is just too hard to look past. I mean, it, it doesn't even look good. And it didn't age well at all. I mean, look, if I were to make a movie about Gauguin, I would probably parody that Loving Vincent movie, you know, that like really cool one uh, painted in his in Vincent's art style. And it was just talking to people about Vincent, getting info about him, you know, after his death. If I were to make this, I would call it Hating Gauguin. And the whole movie would consist of just going around from people to people and probably being told how much of an asshole he was. And I think that'd be funny. I think that'd be nice. In fact, the art style could even reflect his very own art shift and going from decent to good to shit. And the shit portion of the film is the most offensive and it's the most like, uh, hey, yikes, should we, I don't know, still admire this guy portion? And hey, I get it. It's one of those, it's the age old question. Can we divorce the artist from the art, right? I can't answer that for you. That's a personal answer. That's a personal question asked to get a personal answer. Ask yourself that. But I will say this. His art, like I said before, with the cynicism, involves him and his ideas and his feelings about his subject are in his paintings and his work, right? So when he's doing that primitivism shit, he's fully cognizant, and that's how he really feels about this, which is a little concerning. Is he the only one to do this? I don't think so. Probably not. But he, you know, he's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, to do it. So again, to finish the long answer, should we care about Gauguin? I don't know. I don't know. Again, it's a personal dilemma, really. Clearly, I'm in the camp of probably not because of him as a person and the fact that his art is not even that good later on to me to even be sad about saying, no, uh, get him out of here, right? And look, he did paint some decent stuff for sure. And I understand why he gets a lot of praise, but at the end of the day, He's in some of those paintings and they are petty and grotesque and just not good. So, should we care about Gauguin? Nope. Nope, you don't have to. But I highly recommend you take a look at his work and his art and you decide for yourself if it can outweigh his terribleness as a person for you. You know, or I am pretty serious about that Hating Gauguin movie pitch. So if you're interested at all, like, just let me know.